Well, let's once again ask the Lord's help as we turn to his word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you that that you in your infinite wisdom and goodness have have ordered and designed our, our world and its institutions to function in particular ways that would most glorify you and be most good for us. We thank you that your word is clear, that your word is trustworthy, that, Lord, that we can yield our lives to it. And we pray that as we study this, your word today, that you would help us to see its beauty to see its glory, and that we, O Lord, would rejoice in the way that you have designed marriage for our goodness and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this week, as we continue our series of sermons on the marks of a spirit-filled church, you'll recognize when we came to verse 18, where we have kind of taken off here, it says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And as we have been going through then this text, we have now arrived this morning On this particular day, not necessarily by personal planning, but by providential leading to chapter 5 and verse 22. To the words that begin, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, there'll be those in our culture today and those in the professing church today when these words are read will find themselves weeping and gnashing their teeth. But the spirit-filled Christian, as they hear the word of God, readily embraces the entirety of the spirit-inspired word of God. To them, every word of God brings life in the midst of death, light in the midst of darkness. And so the spirit-filled Christian does not want the under-shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ to shrink back from declaring to them the whole counsel of God. They love every jot and tittle of the word of God. They want every word of his, for it is true, it is right, and it is good. And so may God help me this morning as we approach our text to rightly handle the word of truth, to be a workman who has no need to be ashamed but is approved of God in the way that we handle this word of God. And it is very, very essential and important that we come to this text and that we take it with an absolute love and embrace it with a seriousness that is worthy of the Word of God. Why do I say this? Well, because it was really because of our first parents' departure from one single command of God one imperative of God that they turned aside from, and so they and all humanity have fallen into the state where we find ourselves today. All of the disorder, the dysfunction, the brokenness and chaos in our world today was caused because our initial parents didn't take one command seriously. And so we have fallen under the curse of God. This is why marriage This is why the family, the workplace, and our society is in the state that it's in. And as we come to our text, we recognize the Apostle Paul is going to speak of wives and husbands in marriage. He's going to go on to talk about parents and children and the family, and then about work. And what we find is that right away in Genesis, when our our parents fell and disobeyed the Word of God, it had devastating consequences on all of these institutions. We find right away that this happy couple that was there living in eternal bliss in the paradise of God, they were there on this honeymoon in paradise in this garden that God had provided for them. When they disobeyed the word of God, their intimacy and their transparency with one another and with God was entirely altered as they began to cover up and hide. And then we find that Adam who was to be the head of his household and to direct it by the word of God, instead of doing so, allows his wife to be deceived, doesn't act as head of his household, and because of this, they fell, but instead of taking ownership for it, Adam begins to blame God and his wife. And we can say the rest is history when it comes to marriage. What about the family? Well, you come to chapter 4, and as quickly as the family begins, it plunges into chaos and dysfunction. Dysfunction. 
Cain, jealous of his brother, turns on him and kills him. And there we have dysfunction and disorder in the family. And then we turn to work. Adam, who once joyfully worked in God's garden, lovingly doing so, tending it, taking care of it, keeping it. Instead, what we find is at the end of chapter 3, after the fall, is that thorns and thistles will appear. And he will then work to provide for his family by the sweat of his brow. And so we find then a turning away from God's order, a turning away from God's commandments has had devastating effects on marriage, on the family, on work, and on everything else. You can read the rest of the Bible to see how that has been the case. You can read the rest of history and you can take a look at our culture today and at our own lives to see that this is the case. Now, it was, there was a time in many Western nations and in other countries that had embraced the gospel, that had come under the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ and had embraced his word, where the gospel had flourished. We had many generations, because of the transforming power of the gospel in the culture, that it enjoyed, if you will, a reprieve from many of the effects of the fall on these institutions of marriage, of family, and work. And we enjoyed these things for a time because they came as gifts from God as we followed him in his word. But what has happened in our country is we, like the Israelites, tend to forget. We tend to forget the God who ordered these things and the blessings that came because we had yielded to him and come under his word. And so what happened then is we began to worship the gifts that God had given and to love and idolize them rather than the God who gave them. And as we did this, then, we turned away from God as a nation and as a culture. We have done this in our country of Canada. And not only did we turn away from God, but then we began to go to war against God. We set up battering rams against his law and his word. We began to tear it down to disorder our society. We said, God, we will not follow your way. We will not follow your word. We will not follow your law and order for humanity. We want a new world order, and man will be at the center of it all, and we will decide what we will do and how we will do it. We will sing with Sinatra. We will do it our way. And this is the state where we find ourselves today. We have, if you will, gone back to pre-gospel conditions in our country, the very same kind of conditions that the Apostle Paul was facing in his day in Ephesus and in the Roman Empire. As we are going to be looking at marriage over the next couple of weeks, I want us to consider a couple of quotes about the, the Roman Empire and marriage. Consider this one from Demosthenes. He said, we have courtesans for our pleasure, concubines for daily cohabitation, and wives for the purpose of having children legitimately and of having a faithful guardian for our households. Or James Montgomery Boyce in his commentary writes this of how Marshall tells of a woman who had had ten husbands. Juvenal tells of one who had eight husbands in five years. Jerome tells of one Roman matron who was married to her 23rd husband and she was his 23rd or 21st wife. These were the conditions that the Apostle Paul was speaking to as he writes this in the Roman Empire in the first century in Ephesus, speaking of marriage. I think we are heading back to the very same thing. Maybe we've arrived and in some ways gone even further down than this. And you might say, well, what then is the answer to the marital dysfunction and disorder that we see in our day? We spoke last week, there are, if you will, two options. What we have is on this side we have the Lord Jesus Christ, and on the other side we have chaos. Christ or chaos. Christ and a true world order ordered under him in his word, or chaos, a new world order of dysfunction turned away from God and all the resulting consequences that come from it. Paul would recommend to us Christ and his gospel. This is what he has been writing about in the book of Ephesians. In the first three chapters, he outlines the great truths of the gospel. 
How God takes those who were dead in sin, who were following the course of this world as we are today, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now at work in these sons and rebels of disobedience. He says, you Ephesians all once lived in this, following the passions of your flesh, not the word of God carrying out the desires of your bodies and fulfilling them in your minds, and you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God didn't leave them there. God, in His grace, through His gospel, calls men and women to turn from their rebellion against Him and His order. And through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the indwelling spirit to begin to restore a true world order as they live under the lordship of the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens when this happens is that their formerly chaotic, disorderly, divided, dog-eat-dog lives are now increasingly characterized by what we have seen as spirit-filled singing in chapter 5 and verse 19. Spirit-filled thanksgiving is the mark of their life in 520. And submitting out of reverence for Christ as we studied last week in verse 21. Now here is where we left off. And as we noted last week, verse 21 forms a bridge. It is the conclusion of the previous section from verses 15 to 21, and it connects us to the next section that goes on from chapter 5, 22 to 6 and verse 9. It is the fruit and the result of the filling of the Spirit, of the the life that is continually filled of the Spirit, and it results in singing and thanksgiving, and then in submitting out of reverence for Christ. And then the apostle goes on to give examples of what this looks like in various relational spheres. I find it interesting that he gives one verse to singing, one verse to thanksgiving, 21 verses to submitting. Maybe it's because we find it easier to sing than we do to submit. Maybe God knows best and he hunkered down here for a reason under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so we will spend some time considering the fruit of the Spirit-filled life in this submission. It's interesting that as we cross the bridge into verse 22, what we find there is something beautiful if you will, a relational oasis in the midst of a dysfunctional world. Here we encounter symmetry, order, meaning, purpose, and beauty as they were meant to be ordered under the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is what characterizes God's wise and good order for humanity, his blueprint for mankind. Here we have a true orderly world under the Lord Jesus Christ, an orderly home, an orderly family, an orderly marriage, orderly workplaces. Here we have a Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, God-glorifying blueprint for relational order to restore what has been lost in our land and in our homes today. And what you find is the chief characteristic of all of the next three sections that we are going to look at is the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that our marriages, our families, and our workplaces are not what they were meant to be is because Christ has been thrown out. He is no longer Lord of people's lives the way he was intended to be. I want us to see this. I'm not going to read each section, but just look at the first one. Look at this section on marriage and notice who is at the center of it all. 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish.'" 
We could go on, but what we will see then is in, in the, the marriage relationship, in the family relationship, and in the workplace, it is when Christ, when Christ is preeminent, when Christ is at the center, that all of these things find a beauty and, and an order and a symmetry which glorifies God and is absolutely good for humanity. And so today, as we look at verses 22 to 24, I want us to consider four things. First, I want us to consider the high calling of Christ for wives. Christ's high calling for wives. Secondly, the Christ-centered motivation for her to enable her to fulfill this calling. The Christ-exalting purpose for her calling. And finally, the Christ-endowed power that will enable her to fulfill this calling. First of all, then, I want us to look at the high calling for wives. Here we find it in verse 22. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Here, then, we have the wife's high calling, given from the Savior of the church, given from the sovereign Lord of the universe to her. He calls all Christians and all all spirit-filled wives to live a life marked by loving, willing submission, and in the wife's case, submission to her own husband as to the Lord. Now, someone here this morning who has been taking Luke's Greek class or has done so and continues to study and has their Greek New Testament with them might look and realize that the word submit is not there in verse 22. And you might say, well, there are those today who will say, well, the reason it's not there is because it really doesn't belong there. Maybe there is a translation committee that was made up of a bunch of men and husbands and who wanted their wives to submit, and so they snuck the word in there, and the rest of us that only read it in the English go along with it. Is this the case? Well, actually, what we would find, although it is not there, the translation committee did not make a mistake for Paul intends us to carry over what he has been speaking about in the verse before. The foundational principle there of those to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And he goes on then to apply this principle to specific examples and here it is of the marriage relationship. And so then the translators rightly understand that from verse 21 it says, Wives, um, the, and if you translate it literally, it would be wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. Well, wives to your own husbands, what is it speaking of? Well, the submitting that has come in the verse before. Now, someone might question and say, well, well how do you know this? How can you be sure that the Paul actually meant for that to be included in verse 22? Well, we can make our case easily from the immediate context by began by comparing Scripture with Scripture. I want us to notice verse 24. What does it say there? Take a look. Verse 24, it says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, the Greek student might again object and say, well, actually, you know, Pastor, the word submit is there in the first part of that sentence, but it's not included again in the second one. And again, the Apostle Paul is carrying over what is in the first half of the sentence to the other. The Berean literal translation translates this, but even as the church is subjected to Christ, so also wives to their own husbands in everything. But it's assumed that that submission is at the first part of the sentence as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their own husbands in everything. Now, if that is not convincing enough, then we can also compare Scripture with Scripture. And as we turn to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18, just a couple of pages to the right in your Bible, what you will find there is the Apostle Paul has been going through in an abbreviated fashion and a little bit differently the very same truths he's been outlining in Ephesians 5 that we have been and will be studying. And you'll notice then in verse 18 of chapter 3 this. It begins... Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. 
He goes on, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. And then he goes on to the next section, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, and so on. You'll see then the very same flow of thought, the very same pattern. Paul wrote these, both of these books at the very same time. And, and what we find then is there by comparing Scripture with Scripture, and the word submit is there in the Greek in verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands. And so then, we can conclude that this is the case, that Christ's call to the wife is to submit to her own husband as to the Lord. Now, there are those in the professing church today that would then interrupt me and say, well, pastor, we agree with you that wives are to submit to their husbands as to the Lord. But we also like to consider the context, and we believe that the principle that is laid down in verse 21 is to be applied not only to the wives, but also to the husbands. Does it not say to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? And really what Christ is then saying is that the wife is supposed to submit to her husband and the husband is supposed to submit to his, his wife, except he just uses a different word to express the same thing. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Really, he's just saying, submit. We are to mutually submit to one another. And so this principle that is laid down in verse 21 then supersedes any ideas of the wife being the only one who submits because the husband is to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I believe that a careful approach to Scripture will expose this reasoning also to be flawed. I will give you two reasons this morning. First, in the context, if you're going to apply this principle of mutual submission to husbands and wives, then you must be consistent and also apply it to parents and children. Because each of these three things, there is a a group at the beginning that Paul mentions that is called to submit or children to obey and the, the bond servants to obey and then there is instructions for the other. And if you're going to say, well, there must be mutual submission between the wives and the husbands, then are you going to say that children are to obey their parents and parents are to obey their children? I don't think that will go over very well. I don't think that would work very well. And ultimately, the rest of the Bible does not teach this. We don't find people advocating for this, nor do we find people advocating for a reversal of the order in the first part of verse 24. Verse 24 says there, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. But nobody is telling me, and I think it would be heresy to do so, that Christ is to submit to the church. And so if Christ is to be modeled by the husband, and the wife is to model the church and its submission to Christ, then you cannot reverse the order of the wife and the husband or call the husband to submit unless you are willing to say that Christ should submit to the church. And so we see it's clear within the context that this is not the case, nor will it hold up when we compare Scripture with Scripture. For this call to wives to submit to their husbands is not exceptional, it's not unique to this passage in Ephesians 5, 22. But this call for wives to submit to the headship of their husbands from the Lord of the church is clearly articulated not only three times in this passage, in verse 22, 24, and 33, but the same truth is taught in numerous other places in the New Testament, including what we've already looked at, Colossians 3, 18, 1 Corinthians 11, and we find it also in the epistles of Peter, in 1 Peter 3, in verse 1, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, and in 1 Peter 3, 5, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. And finally then, in no place in the Bible do we find it written that husbands are to submit to the headship of their wives. Now you say, well, you've taken quite a bit of time to explain this one thing. Why is that the case? Well, I've done this because spirit-filled Christians... And spirit-filled women are thinking women. They are not women who just mindlessly submit to whatever a man might say, but they absolutely will come under the headship and lordship of Jesus Christ himself. 
Spirit-filled women are Berean women. They search the scriptures and see if these things are so. And they're willing, if they find it in the scriptures, in the word of God himself, to submit themselves to him and to his word, lovingly, willingly. And so, having established this call of Christ to wives, let us look at it in a bit more particular detail. We need to see that this calling is a very particular calling. There are many who here, when they read this verse, will right away in their minds think that it is saying something that it is not. The verse does not say, women submit to men. It's not a blanket statement that all women must submit to all men. That is not what it's saying, nor does it say that all wives are to submit to all husbands. That is not what it is saying either. It is very particular in the language, wives submit to your own husbands. And therefore, a woman who is not married does not have this calling on their life from Christ. It's only when a woman willingly enters into marriage in a marriage relationship with a particular man that he and he becomes a husband to her that now she is called by Christ to submit to him. As I thought about this this week, it is very imperative as we have young women in our midst and you will know others that you might be counseling and speaking to that as they consider marrying a man, that they would reflect on this high calling of Christ to submit to their husband as the church submits to Christ and to think very carefully about whether that man is the kind of person that they could follow that looks like the description that we will look at next week. Don't let emotion, don't let a love for the thought of being married, don't let sort of pictures on the internet of weddings and the joy and all of that stuff kind of take you away. May you think clearly, may you think biblically, may you study relentlessly and know that not emotions, hormones, love of weddings, the dream of being married or anything else should bring you into a relationship with a man that you believe will not follow Christ and that will be very, very, very difficult to submit to. Much misery has been caused for many godly Christian young women because at this point they kind of gave up hope that God could provide for them some man that was more like this. And so then, having established the biblical nature and parameters of Christ's call to wives, I want us to see the compelling motivation that is given for wives to fulfill this calling. I want us to notice that the Bible doesn't say, wives, submit to your husbands because they're absolutely great and always do the right thing. Wives submit to husbands because this is easy. This is the, the, the easiest thing you will ever do. And, and pragmatically, you know, it just works. It works well if you do it this way. This is not what the Bible gives as motivation. But notice the Christ-centered, compelling motivation for this submission. It says, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. As to the Lord. We might translate it as if you are submitting to the Lord. Why is this the case? Because it is the Lord Jesus Christ who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He in his wisdom and he for his glorious purposes has chosen to delegate some of his authority to the husband in the marriage relationship. And so really then in submitting to our husbands as to the Lord, we are submitting to the Lordship of Christ. We do it as to the Lord. He is sovereignly chosen to confer on the husbands this authority and headship in the home, and it is the same Lord Jesus Christ then who calls wives to submit to his order, to submit to his wise and good arrangement for marriage as they come under the headship of their husbands. Now, there are many women today in our world and in the professing church who will outright reject and disdain this essential component for marriage. But I want us this morning to consider the folly of this way. Was it not Jesus Christ who created men and women? Was it not he who designed marriage? It is not he, the creator and designer of men and women and marriage, the one who knows best how it is to function. 
Do you know better than God? That's what got our first parents in trouble in the first place. They thought they would become wise. They would become like God. They were the ones that rejected God's word and went their own way. And look at the results of that path. It seems to me that those who would question the purposes of the creator in marriage are like a woman who is working on an airplane assembly line. And as she's working on the airplane assembly line, what she found is that there were various parts that she had to put together that she came to very much disdain. She didn't like them. She didn't find it easy to put them together. And yet, various engineers with, with much ability and wisdom had put together a blueprint for which this airplane was going to be put together. And yet, she rejected the blueprint, rejected the plan, and decided that some of the parts weren't worthy of putting in. That no one would miss this one. I really don't like doing this, and so I'm going to set it aside. Now, if someone was to do such a thing, we would hope that, at the very least, the airplane would fail right there on the runway and would not be able to take off. And yet, if it did, by some chance, get up into the sky and all of a sudden the parts that were missing began to fail, great would be the crash, great might be the fatalities and the devastation that would be caused by such a thing. Now, some marriages have abandoned God's blueprint, fail before takeoff, and I'm thankful for that. But far too many today have abandoned God's blueprint, and yet they take off anyway, and they come down with a great crash, great devastation, great casualties to family, to friends, to children, to society, to churches, because they have crashed the plane, because they would not submit to that given them by the engineers who ordered the blueprint. And so it is with us when we turn away from the wise and infinitely good plan of God. And so I call all Christian wives that are here today to remember the Creator, to remember the one who ordained marriage, to glory in, lovingly thank Him for the way that He has ordered things, to, to gloriously submit to the call of Christ for His blueprint for your marriage, for He calls you as the one who loved you and gave Himself up for you. Would the one who loved you and gave Himself to die for you mislead you on this point? No, he loves you, and in his wisdom he has given you this command. May you submit to your husbands out of reverence for Christ as unto the Lord. And so, having considered the high calling and considered the compelling motivation for this submission as to the Lord, thirdly, I want us to look at the Christ-exalting reason and purpose for the wife's submission. The Christ-exalting reason and purpose for this calling on the wife. Now, many in our culture today who are blind to the goodness and the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ see this arrangement that has been spoken of here in this text as something that is debilitating, constricting, and oppressive. We hear from them all the time. They would claim that the Bible has been written by men seeking to keep their position of power and keep women oppressed. But I want us to think about that for a moment because we've lived for a while in a culture that has abandoned this very point. And has our culture now better off for doing so? Are, are women more happily married than they've ever been before? Do they more joyfully work in the home under this new world order? Are they more blessed? Do we see women being elevated and exalted in our culture, flourishing in their womanhood as they have been freed from such an oppressive thing as God's beautiful creation order? I think the answer is clear. Take a look around. Divorce is as rampant as the rabbits that produce in the spring, just going on and on, over 50% of marriages Homes are miserable, children are disobedient, the workplace is a disaster. These things have come upon us because we have turned away from God's order. Could it be that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't have evil, oppressive purposes, but actually kind purposes in ordering things this way for wives? One commentator, a wise commentator, an old man, William Hendrickson, says this. He says, now in his kindness toward women, 
the Lord, fully realizing that within the family much of the care of children would rest on the shoulders of the wife, has been pleased to not overburden her. Hence, he has placed ultimate responsibility with respect to the household upon the shoulders of her husband in keeping with the latter's creational endowment. Could it be that in rejecting this order, people are rejecting God's kindness to them? In taking upon something, I, I know what it's like to be a husband in a home and to be an elder in a church where God has conferred a certain amount of responsibility and authority on me. The weight is great. If it wasn't given to me by Christ, I would gladly pass it off to someone else. Do we want to take all of it upon our shoulders? Could it be that Christ, in his wisdom and kindness, has conferred this on another out of love and grace to the wife? God has great purposes in this for the wife and for marriage. Now, many people, when they think about the purpose of marriage, when they go into a marriage, if you'd meet a couple and they were engaged and they were going to be married, you might ask them in the world today, why are you going to be married? Well, they might say, well, because we are in love. We are in love. This is, is why. And, and marriage is all about love. Or they might say, well, I find him or her attractive. They might probe a little further. They might say, well, there are actually financial benefits to being together and having two of us and we can work together on these things financially and in other ways. Or maybe some are getting married even though they've been cohabitating for years and they decide, well, we must get married because I want to appease my parents. They're very traditional and I would like to do this for them just so they would get off my back. Or maybe others have just had a dream of being married and they love the idea of being married and weddings and, and the pictures that they'll have and the things that they can post online and the day that they can celebrate and these kind of things. And they said, well, I've always, since I was a child, I, I looked at all these wedding pictures and I thought well, the, the wife may say, I wanted to get married for these reasons. But if this is the purpose, if this is the reason why we are getting married, what happens then when we have lost that loving feeling? What happens when all of a sudden things tend to wrinkle and droop and sag and we're not quite as attractive as we used to be or don't find the other person as attractive? When the attraction dwindles? Maybe when the finances fail? When the pictures are no longer getting likes on Facebook and it's just regular marriage? A man and a woman, both sinners together in a home. What happens? Many people then call her quits. They leave and head the other way because the purposes for marriage were personal, selfish, and pragmatic. Is this the reason that God gives then for wives to submit to their husbands? Because it's pragmatic, because you'll like it, because it's personal, it's attractive to you. No, notice what he says in verses 23 and 24. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 32, he says again, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Here is God's lofty, elevated culture transcending cosmic glorious purpose for marriage not personal not pragmatic but the purpose of displaying to the world a picture of the gospel in Christ and his church God gave Christ as the head of the church it says here and in Ephesians 1 22 and God has given the husband as head in the home in order that they might be a picture to the world of Christ and his love for the church and he calls wives to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ so the wife's submission to her husband is to be modeled after the church's submission to Christ and it also is to be a model for the church to see how it is that their submission to Christ is to be lived out. Every godly woman, every spirit-filled woman who lives in such a way is a testimony every week to those who are part of the body of Christ calling out to us saying, submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his loving, gracious authority. 
Notice too then, as the church submits to Christ in everything, so the Spirit-filled wife's life is characterized by this, by an honor, it'll say respect later on in the text, a respectful, honorable submission to her husband in everything, it says, as to the Lord. In everything. In everything that is not against the will and word of the Lord, for ultimately her primary allegiance is to Christ alone. If the husband would call her to do something that is against the word of God, she must, like the apostles and others, stand up and say, we will obey God and not men, graciously and humbly, yet doing this, for she cannot submit to another when they are going against the word of Christ, but otherwise, in everything. To have this humble submission, servant attitude in the home, to honor and respect her husband so that the children will see how it is that we are to honor and respect Christ. And she is not to do this thoughtlessly, carelessly, but prayerfully, knowing that the husband's call is to represent Christ in the home, knowing that he will one day answer to the Lord Jesus Christ for how he has lived in the home. And so she gets on her knees and regularly prays for him. She prays for him. She encourages him. She provides wise counsel and gracious counsel to him, knowing his high calling as well as her own. Now, as we think about this, as we bring this to a conclusion, consider what a high calling, what a profound, transcendent reason and purpose for marriage and for a wife to submit to their husbands is this. It's not pragmatism, not personal preference, but picturing Christ and the church. This purpose transcends all time and culture, for it is rooted in the eternal purposes of God. From before the foundation of the world, he had this purpose in mind. It's one of the many reasons why two men do not make a marriage, nor two women can ever make a marriage. Why the culture today, thinking that they can redefine marriage, has done something that is abominable to God and is not good for the flourishing of society. God designed a man and a woman to work together as partners in a marriage, complementary giftedness, one submitting, one leading as Christ loves and leads the church. Two men cannot do this. Two men cannot give us a picture of Christ and his bride. This is an abomination to God, but it is also destructive to human society. It's destructive to people's lives and relationships. We see the devastation all around us. God instituted marriage. The chief end of marriage is to glorify God and to be a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, to testify to Christ's love for the church and the church's submission to Christ. What a transcendent purpose this is. This is why every Christian in general, and wives in this case specifically, must be continually filled by the Spirit in order to accomplish this. The world rails against it. How are we going to stand against the tide of the world that is buffeting marriage and coming against us at every turn, seeking to turn a husband against his wife and a wife against her husband? How is it but if we are spilled, filled, continually filled with the Spirit of God? It's His power within, His help, His ability that allows us to live in this way. It's His fruit of love, His fruit of self-control that will enable the wife to do such a thing that none other can do except for the spirit-filled wife who wants to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And as wives carry out this high calling in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ, what we find is as she does this in the midst of a lost, dark, and disorderly world, her life declares to that lost world that her Lord is Jesus Christ alone that she is not her own, she has been bought with a price. Her marriage will testify that Christ's word and not the changing culture is her high standard. Her actions will demonstrate that she is no longer a slave to sin, but she has been set free to live for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, transformed by the power of the gospel. People will look at her and say, what are you doing? 
Why would you do such a thing? And she can say, oh, let me tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ who set me free from the way that I was going and brought me to himself out of love. And he's given me the privilege and opportunity of being a picture of the submission of the church to such a gracious Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for me to come under his headship, under his lordship, to demonstrate to you that you too must submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. For the new world order that has abandoned God, has turned us away from him, has brought the devastation that we see today. But Christ and his gospel has transforming power to restore the true world order. And it is to this that Christ is calling each one that we meet every day. And the wife who submits to her husband in this way is calling the world truly to come and to submit to the lordship of Christ, to come into his kingdom, to come under his order. And so with this high calling, may we pray for one another that in our marriages that this would be truly fulfilled, that in the midst of a lost world, the gospel would go forth in our words and in our lives as we live according to God and his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are all wise, that you are all good, that your word is perfect and true. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Oh Lord, may we follow it. May we submit to you. May we submit to your word. May we submit to the Lordship of Christ in all things. And Lord, we pray for the wives among us today that they would see the goodness of God in this exhortation and command, that they would love your word and, and, and Lord, see the beauty of what you have done and the way that you have put this together. And they, out of love for Christ, out of reverence for Christ, would lovingly go about shining light into the midst of a darkened world that has rebelled against your word, that has turned away from your order and your purposes, O oh Lord. We see the devastation all around us. May we be salt and light in the midst of such a generation. May we not, O oh Lord, be conformed to the pattern of this world, but may we demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel to that world that so desperately needs it. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the clarity of your word. May your spirit make our hearts tender to it and give us power to obey it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.